Good afternoon, I'm Luke Nicholson, I'm a consultant ophthalmologist here in Moorfields, and today I've been asked to talk about setting up a high volume medical retina virtual clinic using a diagnostic hub approach. So to make sure I'm in time. So before I begin, I need to mention that this is by no means a prescriptive lecture, and there's no single way to deliver a high volume virtual clinic. It's just us um, sharing our experiences, the lessons we have learned, and challenges and outcomes running a virtual clinic, a high volume virtual clinic. These are my disclosures. So the topic that I'm going to touch on is looking at what, what exactly is a virtual clinic, comparing this with a traditional clinic. We'll look at models of delivering a virtual clinic, different methods. We'll also go into detail about the setup, the pathway, the eligibility, the staffing, the equipment, the infrastructure. So IT, electronic medical records. We'll also look at communication with patients and fail safe, very importantly, fail safe, systemic or manual. For the managers, we look at cost comparison and as well the governance surrounding the virtual clinics. We'll also talk about our model and our experience along with our outcomes and challenges that we've faced. And finally, to end, talking about COVID-19 recovery and beyond. So what exactly is a virtual clinic? So there are many names to this, and virtual clinic is probably what we've commonly used. There are alternative names, such as a digital clinic, which is what we use in Morefields. Our colleagues in the Royal Eye Unit in Kingston uses a two-stop clinic. And there's also surveillance clinics. But what generally happens is a dissociation between the basic assessment and imaging with a clinical assessment. That dissociation is actually what's happening in a virtual clinic. So it's not entirely virtual. The assessment or the clinical assessment is virtual or simulated, but the patients still come in physically for an appointment, have the images and the basic assessment done. Now let's talk about a patient journey in a traditional clinic model. So a patient comes in, they check in, they have to they wait, they get called by a nurse or technician, they have their vision, their pressures, and they are dilated, they wait. They have their scan, so the OCT scan. Then they sit in the waiting room to be called by the clinician. They have an assessment and they need treatment, they get treatment. They are communicated about what's the problem and what's the management plan. They get a letter that is going to the GP about the outcome. And their outcomes are actioned. So they need a follow up in six weeks, six months, etc. And they go home. Now, in a traditional clinic, it's important not to forget the staff that's needed. So you have the admin team doing the checking in, the nurse or healthcare system with the vision and IOP and dilation. You have the technician with the imaging. You have a clinician then with the assessment and treatment and communicating the outcomes. You have secretaries to type out the letter and post it to the GPs. And you have the admin team as well to action the outcome again. Now, what's interesting about the traditional clinic is this initial stage of checking in the initial assessments and the OCTs, although I agree some OCTs are, take longer than others, but generally the journey time is consistent. And once it is consistent, you can plan the journey time better. So you can have better models of your clinic profile as to when the patient comes in, so you don't end up with patients waiting a long time. However, the assessment and treatment can be variable. Some patients can be 10 minutes, some can be an hour. And that variable time affects the patients in the waiting room. And that's how we end up with crowded waiting rooms, a patient waiting hours to be seen. And this is then followed, of course, with the letters and the outcome. So in a virtual model, the patient uh, coming in, having this initial assessment and imaging is now dissociated from the clinical assessment. So the patient comes in, they have the assessment in a very linear format that's very predictable and they go home. The assessments are then done at a later time or date. Instead of the patient waiting in the waiting room, they are going home and waiting at home for the report. Letters and outcome later is done upstream. And the beauty about this format is, one, it's predictable, it's planned, the waiting time is less, and the journey time is less. But what's also interesting is most of our clinics, the last scan is done at 3.30, for example, or 4 o'clock because you need to factor in the assessments. 
but in a virtual format because they're going home you can expand your clinic up to five o'clock for example for the last scan because you can maximize the flow because the patient goes home after that now there are several ways to deliver a virtual clinic model and the different models available reflect the different levels of safety or safety netting within the system different levels of filtering high-risk patients so the two models that I'm going to describe here. So the first model is what we call an asynchronous with deferred assessments and the incorporation of red flags. So a patient comes in, have the vision, pressures and dilate, they have the imaging, and then they go home. However, you can incorporate red flags and the red flags could vary. So we can use things like pressure above 40 or patients with vision change or vision drop of two lines. Uh, unable to obtain images, etc. So the red flags work as a safety net. It's important to keep the red flags in binary uh, rather than something subjective. So a patient's pressure or vision, something numerical that you can you can really follow uh, to the letter and not something that you would say a very subjective gray area. And these patients are then uh, flagged up and converted to a face-to-face -face consultation if needed. And this allows same-day treatment or investigations and of course they follow through the traditional format so the benefits of such a system is it's safe so high-risk patients patients losing vision etc picked up and treated on the day and by doing that they avoid duplicate appointments and what's difficult or challenge when it comes to this format is that added patients into an already busy face-to-face -face clinic can be quite difficult it also risks crowding the waiting room in a face-to-face -face clinic that's already quite crowded and it requires an on-site face-to-face clinic uh, for this to work. Now, the second model is something that's really good for really low-risk cases or low-risk cases. Uh, a patient comes in, they have vision, pressure, and dilate. They have the imaging, and they go home. Of course, there's no red flags here, but in any service like this, you would still need a clinical oversight, either on-site or remotely, for any queries for urgent, urgent or emergency problems. So the benefits of such a service is there's less crowding because they follow a linear pathway with predicted times. You can facilitate standalone imaging hubs because you don't need a face-to-face -face adjacent clinic. So this could be anywhere. Uh, you can have less pressure onto the face-to-face -face clinics in this model. Main limitations of this model is they may require added visits in some small group of patients and that urgent bring back rate is very important to monitor because that defines the success of the, uh, of, this, of the model. And this model made really good triaging because you want to ensure that there are low risk cases. Now we'll go into detail about each, sorry, each stage of the process. So the history, um, most patients are follow-up patients that you or we, the clinician, has initiated the follow-up. So you know a diabetic patient, you're seeing them again to look for new vessels or recurrence of DMO. So you can focus your history on this. So any vision change, is it stable, is it worse, is it better? Is there any distortion? Is it acute, is it gradual? You also can ask things like, do they have diabetes? Because that's important so that you do write a diabetic retinopathy report. Um, things like if they're pregnant, uh, had a stroke or heart attack, those things are useful to facilitate the thought process behind injections, etc. Vision, uh, Snellen or Thompson, either one. Uh, pressures, eye care or aura in the medical retina lanes or virtual clinics, we use eye care. But it's good that in some of our hubs, we have an adjacent glaucoma virtual hub and uh, patients with high pressures can be double checked with an aura. And dilation is contentious. We dilate everyone with 1% uh, of tropicamide only. And non mentoriatic imaging is optional. So nowadays there is a very good cameras that can take undilated images. Um, and that's an option for the younger patients. We've elected for dilating everyone as this is useful in the, to make sure that every image is gradable. We find that undilated images, if it does compromise the gradability of the image and the patient has to come back, that is uh, counterproductive. Of course, with repeat audits, we, we are looking at this again, and if it's something we can we can improve on. Now, the imaging protocols. So the you can have OCT only pathways, or OCT and wide field pathways. 
or HCQ's pathway is a number of different other protocols. So in OCT only pathway, if you don't have a wide field camera, you can still run a virtual clinic. So in an OCT only pathway, you do an OCT on the macula. You can do a color or multicolor photo of the posterior pole. And what I would recommend is also include a discentered uh, and a fovea centered color picture, uh, multicolor picture. And this could include your R1 patients, uh, R1, M1 sort of patients in your virtual clinic. Saying this, an OCT only pathway would probably only give you about 10 to 15 percent of your patients that can go down this pathway. Um, mainly because the color photos sometimes do lead uh, to slightly difficult to grade images and therefore what is suitable is only about 12 to 15 percent. An OCT and wide field uh, pathway is preferred. This really expands the ability of your clinics to you know, virtualize a larger number or percentage of patients. So patients comes in with an OCT of the macula and they have a wide field color photo, either Optos or Claros or whichever wide field system you have. In this format, we've looked and audited our numbers and we find that you can see about 40 to 45 percent of patients confidently in a virtual format. HCQ protocols, you can have a special protocol for different conditions. So HCQ, for example, if you have a wide field component, then you'll do an OCT, uh, a macular OCT and autofluorescence, 35 degree possibly. And you can do a wide field autofluorescence to top it up to look for that 12% of patients with purely extrapobial changes. Now, settings. So this is where Spectralis really shines. It's like a SLR camera uh, with a lot of options to manipulate to get the best out of it as opposed to a point and shoot. So Spectralis, the option to manipulate really helps. Um, for example, you can have, apologies for that. So you can have detailed imaging for most patients um, with modified, sorry. So you can have detailed imaging for most patients. You can tailor your, your imaging um, settings. So for example, in the Spectralis, you can have customization of your settings so you can have one specific to a certain clinic you can have a hcq setting so what we do in more fields we have a wider setting covering a larger area the oct and this is really useful to look at the nvds or collaterals that you're looking at the disc also good at looking at the peripapillary disease uh, cnvms etc because most of the time if you just take a macular oct you miss that area it's very difficult to then tell a technician that the patient comes in, please also OCT the disc if you suspect something and you're leaving that to chance. So it's best to just do a scan in a wider area. So that really helps. We also have a HCQ setting where you have a denser uh, scan with a higher ART that really highlights a ellipsoid layer, which is where you want to look at. Um, so those little features, you can set it up to suit your clinic. And the autofluorescence uh, ability in the spectralis is very good. That's really useful for your HCQs and CSR and EMD patients. Now, equipment. Um, there's a high startup cost, of course. And the OCT, ideally one with color or multicolor modality if you're not using a wide field component. And the wide field camera is, of course, preferred. Um, and it helps with reducing the ungradable cases. You also need to factor in the vision charts, the eye care, and the estates involved. Now, clinics. The clinics are ideally based on either disease or imaging protocols, or both if you can. So if you, did, you base the clinics on disease, it really helps the assessment side of things. So you can base the, the clinics on simple cases, complex MR, or AMD, diabetic, R1M1. This really helps. So you have an R1 or diabetes clinic, then you can have optoms or diabetic retinopathy graders working in your clinic. If you have more complex clinics, then you can have your fellows, especially doctors, assigned to that assessment. So that really helps. And imaging protocols, if you can base your clinic on imaging protocols, so you have a, an imaging protocol, for example, uh, MR1 or HCQ, or you can label it one, two, three, where one is OCT only, two is white field, three is um, maybe with autofluorescence. So you then can put the autofluorescence group, your HCQs, your CSR, etc., can go down that route. So that's something to play around with to, to design your clinics based on either the assessments with the disease or based on the technicians to help the technicians with um, an imaging protocol attached to it. Now, eligibility, this is important. 
Um, ideally, virtual should be for follow-up patients where the diagnosis is confirmed or you have a clear management plan if you're uncertain of the diagnosis. So this could include your stable AMD, patients previously treated, or patients with some lesions that you want to monitor, or patients with mild or moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Um, severe non-proliferative, I'll be cautious uh, because of your risk of NDs, um, but that's a case-by-case -case basis. Stable treated PDR, so they had laser, they showed regression of the NDs, not needed further laser in six months. Those are suitable for virtual. HCQs are brilliant for virtual clinics. Central serous choreoretinopathy is fine as well. Um, branch retinal vein occlusion is great. So the macular BRVOs, you can do an OCT only pathway, to be honest. But if they have BRVO affecting the extra uh, outside the arcades, it's ideal in a, in a wide field pathway. I've avoided central retinal veins here because central retinal vein occlusion, sorry, because the, you're unable to assess the anterior segment. So new patients are debatable. Ideally, you avoid new patients because the diagnosis is uncertain. It's a risk and there's a probability of needing to bring them back into face-to-face, -face, thus duplicating appointments. Um, we've run a rapid access AMD clinic uh, a few years ago where all new patients uh, with curie maculopathies are referred. It's tricky, we've audited that and we found a large number coming back just for repeat assessment because on the face-to-face -face because you're quite uncertain of what's happening around the eye. Um, and it's a big risk because the diagnosis is unclear. You can find a patient with a detachment or optic neuropathy, you know, coming to that clinic. So it's something that you need to keep an eye on. So ideally avoided. However, routine diabetics, well, saying that there is still space for it if it's done appropriately. Um, so routine diabetics um, is possible. So what we we only accept the routine diabetics that are 618 or better with no non-DR pathology. So your R1M1s, your R2s, uh, with decent vision, they can come to a virtual setup because you know why you're bringing them in. The asymptomatic HCQs as well, perfect for virtual, so you don't need, they can be new patients in a virtual setup. You need to exclude patients with any media opacity because of the images, so patients with corneal problems, uh, corneal scars or dense cataracts, ideally avoided because you get rubbish, uh, sorry, poor quality pictures. Um, or patients you can't image, yeah, wheelchair bound, etc. It's difficult to get uh, the scan. Or patients with advanced dementia or poor cognitive function, uh, it's very hard to predict the cooperation on the day and whether they can get, and you can get good images. And it's not, they usually, with carers, it's not ideal to put them through the stress of duplicate appointments if you can avoid it. Staffing, for example, is very important and needs to be costed. So the examination can be a band tree technician. The imaging side can be a trained band tree technician as well. As for assessors, they can be optometrists, medical retina trained optometrists, fellows, registrars, STs, consultants. I would say registrars and fellows are, are great in virtual, but I would and they need to be involved because that's the future. But they, we need to do, we limit the numbers because they need the face-to-face -face, uh, element to, to learn difficult cases as well. But for optometrists, I think it's a great tool to, to progress in their careers. You need fail-safe officers as well. It's important to staff and cost this. And you need admin support. It's important not to forget admin and secretarial support. So if you have um, increased your activity by 20 30%, then yes, you need added support for admin and secretarial support for, for this. Now, assessment is interesting. So you can have consultant-led or consultant-delivered services. So if you have a smaller uh, virtual clinic module where you have lesser numbers, then I think it's perfectly reasonable and cost-effective to be a consultant-delivered system. However, in a high-volume system, sorry, if you have a high-volume system, you have a large number of patients, it's very difficult to supplement that with all consultants. So in such a system, you can run a team of optometrists, of fellows, or registrars, and a consultant. So a consultant can lead the team with a couple of fellows and registrars, and that can be your, your group that assesses the patients. The assessments can be remote, so you can support remote access to patients. Uh, so, so you can support remote, so, um, remote assessments. Um, you need the remote access enabled. And this is probably only can be done if you have a purely paperless system with, uh, with a good EMR. You need minimum screen settings as well, because you can't expect, uh, it's not ideal that they assess things on a phone. Uh, so you need minimum screen settings uh, before this can be done. So in a pure remote assessment, you can have a virtual clinic where we have teams to discuss cases anonymously um, to support real-time discussions. 
Now template for the assessments, now this is interesting uh, and it's variable depending on your local IT speed, your case mix, your complexities and your model that you choose. However, as a general rule of thumb, you can see 80% more cases uh, in a virtual session than you could in a face-to-face -face session. So you can see 10 patients per session in a face-to-face -face session, you can see 18 in a virtual setup. Now, infrastructure is really important not to forget the infrastructure when you set up a virtual clinic. The IT is key and paramount in this. So always involve IT when you scale up your virtual clinics to ensure that the current systems in place are reliable and able to support the sudden increase in the demand on your IT systems. Because failure in the IT system can, can, be, can be disastrous and catastrophic to the system, to the model of the virtual clinics. Electronic medical records, so this is key. It supports the virtual service. You can run it with notes, but uh, good EMR will really support the service really well, and as I said, support remote assessments, OpenEyes, Medisoft, etc. Imaging platforms, ideally a vendor neutral archive um, enabled system that allows you to see multiple images in one software. But however, I think that's, that's, that should come in the future. Things like high expects, etc., can help. At the moment, we in Morpheus are using different, opening different softwares, but in the future, hopefully, that will make things faster. And electronic lab records, if you can get past the IG. So, talking about letters. Um, so electronic letters, if you can get past the IG. So talking about electronic letters, um, communication with patients. So this is key, actually. Um, so the communication with patients is two, two parts. The prior to the clinic appointment. So this is your appointment letter. And the appointment letters should be clear. It should explain to the patient they're coming in for a virtual appointment, having their assessments, and not going to see a doctor. That's important because otherwise it can lead to some frustration in patients expecting to see a doctor. A patient information leaflet is really useful to reassure patients that they're still safe and they're still assessed properly. In fact, quite, quite and better than some some face to face. And it's important to stress this to patients and reassure them of the process. Otherwise, it's a it's quite unexpected. They they might not understand. And following the appointment to communicate the results. So to close the loop of the patient's journey, they need to know. The outcome of the appointment. This could be a written correspondence or a telephone consultation. Ideally, a written correspondence because it's quicker to do and you can see more patients. You can use templates to help you assist, but what's important with a written correspondence is to address the patients in your letter and copy the GP. So it's not a letter to the GP copying the patient, it's the other way around. And try to avoid medical jargon or minimize the medical jargon you use and, it's, you know, and realize that this is the Way you're communicating with the patient to explain what's happening. So in layman, uh, in, in, in understandable languages um, that the patient appreciates and understands. Telephone consultation can supplement the written correspondence. So this, what we do is for patients requiring treatment, for example, injections of lasers, or you need more of a history, we call them up to discuss the treatment and get a verbal consent before booking them in for an appointment to receive treatment. You don't want to bring them in with not realizing that they need injections or treatment, and you don't want to waste an injection slot as well. Calling every patient after an imaging clinic is, uh, is nice, but um, it takes time, and it reduces the number you're able to assess. It also becomes a problem when IT, if it doesn't function or you don't have staff, because in a telephone clinic, you're given the time to the patient. You say 9 o'clock, 9.30, between that hour, you're going to call them, 9 to 10. And if IT fails or you don't have staff, which I'll touch on later, then it becomes a problem. So ideally, I would avoid it, but it's an option. Failsafe is something really important and easily forgotten. So we'll go through a traditional model. So a patient comes in, they check in, they have the vision, they scan, they sit in the waiting room. If you don't call them, they, they get upset and they start knocking on your door to be seen. So that is a, a fail-safe in some regard. Um, if you see a patient with a detached retina, you tend to send them off and get it treated or a problem, you treat them, urgent problem, you treat them on the day. Um, and then you give them the outcome at the end. And in uh, traditional clinics, the fail-safe is present to ensure that all outcomes are actioned. Um, so that's perfectly fine as a traditional model. In a virtual model, is different. You've now dissociated 
the assessment side, uh, sorry, the clinical assessment and the imaging, you've dissociated them. So you have the traditional outcome to make sure the outcomes are action, and usually you get this in, in a month's time or something. But what's important here is if you scan them and they go home and it turns out to be something urgent, like a detached retina, for example, but they, this patient is missed. Uh, if you're using notes and notes are removed from your trolley, no one assesses the patient. You don't know about the patient until a month later you find out, oh, there's no outcome for the patient Y. So that's dangerous. And then you find out they have a detachment or, or CNVM that needs treatment. So that's important. The fail safe is not only important in the outcome, but to ensure that patients are assessed in a timely manner, which is important to prevent uh, morbidity among them, amongst patients. So that's important in the virtual clinic. So to ensure that your fail safe is not just your routine fail safe, but a slightly heightened fail safe to assess these cases. Now it can be done manually. So if it's a smaller virtual setup, so more clinics, you can have a single fail-safe officer to ensure that all patients are assessed, and that all attended patients are assessed in a timely manner. You can also ensure that the letters are posted out to the patient to ensure that that loop where the patient received the outcome is completed. And of course, the outcome of the appointment itself when to come back is done, so they're not lost to follow up. So that's important. However, when you run a diagnostic hub approach, a high volume medical retina virtual clinic, it's quite difficult to have a single person doing all this, monitoring 1,200 over patient appointments a week. So you have to use your current systems. And that's where um, EMR comes in, a good EMR, because we in Morfield, so we use the PAS as our booking system. PAS, so we need a system or a report to pull out data from the booking system to see who's attended which clinic are they really attended, their DNA, we then pull out information whether the letter has been created or assessment has been completed, and also as go back to PAS to make sure that the outcomes are done. So you have multiple stages and you need reports to say the attendance, the DNA, the letter, the correspondence, and the outcome. So this needs to be fail-safed. Um, so having a system-based report that pulls this information really helps uh, a wide-scale um, high volume service. So you still have fail-safe officers overseeing it, but you have uh, the system reporting that helps them. Plus the system-based report uh, really gets rid of human error that can happen in a, in a manual service. Now for managers, the cost comparison. So approximately, if you're looking at traditional model, uh, of course this is not exact and every site will be slightly different. But generally, you're looking at 50 to 55 pounds per appointment. In a virtual model, you're looking at 30 to 35 pounds. So it's a significant saving of 20 pounds per appointment. If you're looking at 10,000, sorry, 1,000 appointments a week, you're looking at 20,000 savings. So it's a huge amount. We cannot forget the governance surrounding virtual clinics. So MDT meetings needs to happen regularly. So you're looking at your IT team, your admin team, your secretaries, your clinicians, your technicians, your, your fail-safe officers. So it's important to group them up and discuss problems and how to improve the service and communication amongst, because, amongst the team because it's very important that we're all working in isolation but we all come under a pathway and everyone has to work together or link up well. Incident reporting as well, reporting problems, reporting uh, complications, um, assessing these complications as a team to find out ways to improve. It's a new service, so it's important to highlight these things. Teaching and training here, um, virtual clinics are, are fantastic. So in a face-to-face -face clinic, you have a really interesting cool case, for example, and you are lucky enough to see the patient. Um, occasionally, you call your colleagues and everyone looks at the patient. The poor patient goes through six people looking in his eye with a slit lamp and a bright light. But in a virtual setup, uh, you can easily call your colleagues to all look at the same screen and discuss cases and the consultant can actually show them the pathology on the photos and everyone can learn together. So it's actually quite a good learning tool um, for junior doctors. Audit, audit, audit. Uh, uh, we've audited a lot of our results just to have an idea how things are going, what we can do to improve things. And I'll touch on that later as well. An induction and appraisal of staff. So let's go into the hub process. So there are three pretty much three models. So model one is a single room with vision, pressures, dilate, and history that takes about 15 minutes. An OCT takes about five minutes, and a wide field image takes about 10 minutes. This includes cleaning the machine. 
And this is a single room with one tech. So the beauty about this is you limit or minimize the technician patient contact, especially in the pandemic, you want to reduce that. So one technician doesn't end up seeing 40 patients uh, to an OCT, but he or she just sees one patient. Of course, it doesn't need to be in a room throughout the time. If the patient dilates, you can leave, the technician can leave. And the good thing about this model is that there's less pressure on the waiting room. So the patient comes in once and they go home. They don't keep going back and forth. And if you have a patient um, on a wheelchair or a mobility issue, or your waiting room is quite far, then this model is quite good because you save a lot of time moving them around. In model two, you have two rooms with vision, IOP, dilate, history, and OCT, taking 20 minutes each, and that feeds into one wide field room. And model three, of course, you dissociate it even further with vision, IOP, dilate, and history, taking 15 minutes each, and OCT, five minutes, and then feeding into two wide field systems, wide field rooms. So now looking at the three models, uh, so model one will need one room in a four hour period because it's 30 minutes per patient can take eight patients. And in a year with 10 sessions a week in a 48 week year, you're probably getting 3,800 patients appointments. You need one band three technician, one OCT, one wide field camera, <clears throat> and one chart of vision and eye care. So of course, if you duplicate this model, you can multiply it by two lanes and then you just duplicate everything. The cost per appointment is still the same at about 43 pounds per appointment. In the first year in the second year it's about nine pounds because of course you're not paying for the kit again you're just paying for the staff in model two you have three rooms now you can see 22 patients per four hour period that's about 10,500 appointments per year you need three technicians two OCTs one wide field camera and two vision charts and eye care and then it comes to about 22 pounds in the first year about 10 pounds in the second year per appointment I need to stress that this does not take into account the room cost, and that depends on the rent and your space. But this is just looking at the technicians, the, the, the wages of the technicians, and the kit cost. It doesn't take into account the administrative secretarial support that comes with it, because that doesn't really matter which model. It, that just depends on the numbers of patients. And model three, you have six rooms, about 43 uh, appointments per session. 20,000 per year, six bantry techs, one OCT, two wide field cameras, and three vision charts. So that comes to about 20 pounds per appointment and 10 pounds in the second year. So overall, you can see that model two and model three is probably the preferred go-to model here in terms of um, reducing the costs. Now let's talk about our pilot model. So in our initial pilot, we had uh, the imaging hub that did a number of different bundles, they call it diagnostic bundles. So they had either an OCT pathway, a wide field pathway, or a HCQ pathway, and they go home. We have red flags incorporated, and this was strict vision decrease of two lines or more on a Snellen, or 15 letters or more, oh, sorry about that, uh, 15 letters or more on an ETDRS chart, and a pressure of more than 32 millimeters of mercury. These patients were flagged up, and a real-time remote assessment was formed by the assessment team, they were then decided to either convert to a face-to-face -face appointment or go straight for an injection appointment. So if they have reactivation of CNVM, for example, they can go straight to our injection service, assessed by a doctor and deliver treatment. So this allows same-day investigations and treatment. Um, and of course, patients who are not flagged up then of course have a virtual asynchronous or deferred assessment. So using this model, and we were quite safe to start with because we wanted to be sure, this was over a six week period, a lot of DNAs, but over a thousand con consecutive attendances. We booked appointments about 1,400. And what we found is about 64% actually retained or remained in the virtual setup. 20% uh, were followed up in the face to face clinic, 5% either in injection or laser clinic, and about 8.5% were discharged. Now, it's important to remember that the virtual and face-to-face -face is a very fluid process. So a patient can go from virtual to face-to-face -to -face and face-to-face -to, -face to virtual, and that is expected. They're not staying in one pathway forever. It's quite nice to utilize it. So if you treated a patient, you don't have, you can try to see them once a year in a face-to-face, -face, but the appointments in between can be virtual. So it's important to look at that. Um, 
But what's important here is the urgent outcome. So we found about 6% needed an urgent review within two weeks and 11% within one month. So that's our urgent bring back rate. So that's quite low. Um, if you have it about 30, 40%, then you really, cr the, the, the model breaks down. I think less than 20%, it's a successful model. And what's very important here is no cases required emergency same day treatment. So that's really reassuring that none of them really needed anything urgent on the day. Despite our red flags picking this up and treating patients on the day, most of them could come back easily within a week for treatment. So this is great work done by Darren Hanuman Tadu, who is not one of our star fellows. He's going off to Royal Free as a consultant. Um, he's done a lot of work with this. <coughs> Excuse me. So in terms of patient experience, we looked at that, and generally the ma majority of patients were happy with the outcome. They were very the experience. They they were satisfied. Uh, then you're always going to get one or two who are slightly less than happy. Um, mainly because, and what we found is, it's a culture change between what they're used to and also communication, and that's something we're working hard to improve on. Communication with patients seems to be the main issue because they're not able to ask the doctor or the clinician or get a report directly verbally from the patient. I think that part becomes a problem, but they're not aware of what to expect in the virtual clinic. So we've worked hard with information leaflets and appointment letters being quite clear and trying to improve our correspondence with patients. So that really helps. So using the data that we've got from Darren's work in our pilot model, we've scaled it up uh, with a different model where the red flags are now reduced. What we found with that original model was a lot of patients, about 5% were converted to a face-to-face -face on the day. So if you're seeing 100 patients a day, there's added 10 patients, uh, 5 to 10% uh, were converted to a face-to-face -face on the day. And that gives a lot of extra work on the face-to-face -face clinics. Um, it becomes uh, an added stress. So it's good when they can account for the DNAs, but so improving your utilization of the service, but at the same time, the unpredictability of when they come in becomes a problem. So we've scaled that down to only include red flags of patients with pressures above 40. And that's reduced the numbers converting to a face-to-face -face on the day. We know it's safe. Uh, we know other patients um, can be treated within a week, so it's safe. Uh, so we switched to this model, and this is the model we've settled on. So there's still some supervision or red flags or pressure above 40, but also supervision uh, if any of the technicians need support or help. So we've audited this as well. So this is across the trust over a two and a half week period. We've looked at 2,000 patients in April, so 2,000 attendances, uh, 2,500 appointments with a DNA rate of 23%. And you look at the outcomes, 63% um, again followed up in virtual, which is similar. Injection clinics, face-to-face -face is slightly higher than before. But that may be just a reflection of the fact that we're not seeing some of the face-to-face -face on the day uh, and about 7% discharge. But what's important here is the urgent bring back rate again. Now it's down in this 8.6%. So despite reducing the red flags, we find that we're still not bringing a lot of patients back urgently. Still only 8% or 9% are brought back urgently within a month. So that's fantastic. And also better than the earlier audit that we did in September last year that was about 11.7%. The main reason for that probably is just a reflection of our recovery. We're seeing more of our patients in a timely manner. Initially, it was more patients who've been deferred since March. Still, it's important to remember that about 50% still comes back within a six month period. Now, challenges that we faced, I'm just making sure we're on time. Challenges that I've, we faced as a service, IT has been the biggest challenge. The IT team has worked really hard but the sudden strain of such an escalation of the way we've done our, uh, of our clinics and our, our, the numbers of images going through, the numbers of people logging in to assess um, the IT, there's a lot of strain on IT and there's several failures in IT some days or some sessions. And that really put a big, big, um, makes the virtual model quite difficult. So that has been tough, but we uh, seem to have overcome a lot of it. Um, fail safe, yes. Um, couldn't we used to fail safe manually but such a large number we needed a much smarter approach so we've developed reporting systems now using as i mentioned open eyes and our pair system to try to incorporate the different stages so we can easily pull out reports that assist uh, a person to fail safe the service culture change within patients uh, and clinicians actually so patients who are used to face-to-face -to -face appointments will suddenly find this approach different and some may find it a bit um, 
they might not like it. So I think that culture change is something that we need to educate our patients, um, you know, through information leaflets to to add to information material so they understand. I think with the way things are changing, with the way we we're living our lives these days with COVID, um, it's now and ever basically to to do a whole shift in the way we do things. Uh, it needs a, a concerted effort among all clinicians to get this to work. So you need all your colleagues. It's not just the virtual team. It's the face-to-face, -face, the injections, the nurses, etc. All have to work together to get this to work. There's a huge upfront cost to remember, so but it will pay off. And of course, culture change we've mentioned before. So the benefits of a virtual clinic. That's a picture of our Hoxton hub. Uh, it's a shorter appointment time. It's much quicker. Half an hour, 45 minutes. You're done. Uh, faster access to treatment because of the enhanced capacity. So with such a model, we are seeing 600, we are seeing 600 more patients uh, in City Road in Hoxton through a virtual model. Uh, across the trust, you're looking at 1,200 more appointments a week in Morefields. And this uh, helps in our recovery. It clears up the face-to-face -face clinics to, so that patients can access treatment in the face-to-face -face clinics faster. And of course, once the recovery is done, it future-proofs the service uh, for an ever-increasing demand and ever-limited resource. It's cost effective in the long term. There's an upfront cost, which is still cost effective in year one, but in the long term, it really helps and pays off. Um, there's a low, you have to monitor the urgent bring back rate for the face to face clinic. So far um, in our models, it's been low and successful. Now, what's really beautiful about the virtual format is the flexible working or staffing. So, there's two ways to look at it. If you have virtual assessment on site, we have a rota of face-to-face -face doctors and virtual doctors. So if, especially now in the pandemic, if anyone has a cold or a cough, sorry, a cough or fever, they're isolating or shielding, or if they have a relative or family member who's sick or unwell, they are isolating as well. So that sudden, you know, on Monday morning, you find out two people are off and your clinic's crippled. So having that option where the virtual fellow or virtual doctor can then move into the face-to-face -face because you have a patient in the building that needs to be seen, that's a priority. You can then uh, plan for the virtual assessments to be done at a later time. So that flexibility really helps the service. Secondly, remote working is, is a huge help. So staff that, um, that would normally be in the face-to-face -face clinic, if he or she is isolating, they can then swap with the virtual doctor um, and assess patients remotely. From home while the other person then goes into face to face so it really helps you um, have uh, keep business as usual so to speak uh, without too much of an impact with the sickness and um, patient and staff illnesses around and secondly working from home really gives uh, help with the space now how about COVID-19 recovery and beyond so all of us have thousands of patients in our backlog we really need a high volume service or hub to really get through these patients in a cost effective manner, to clear the backlog in a safe manner uh, and to future proof the service. So using a virtual model really is proven to be very successful as a cost effective method and to really increase capacity to an extent that you'll never achieve in a face to face format. And it's safe um, and accepted by patients as well. Finally, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I know we talked a lot about the details of a virtual format, a virtual clinic. Um, I'm more than happy to take questions and feel free to email me any queries you may have. I'll do my best to, to reply and we can always discuss um, virtual patterns or models. I'm more than happy and keen to learn from other units that are successful uh, to see whether we can learn from them, uh, you guys to, to improve. And I'm happy to share uh, advice as well. Thank you very much.